at the same time that we know how important early uh, childhood investments are, we know that there can be a tremendous return. Um, we know that not every program is as successful as the next program. And there is tremendous space for innovation and improvement, right? So, um, you know, I'll channel my best Jack Shonkoff. <laughs> um, for those of you that don't know, Jack is the, the pioneer that started the center at Harvard that has all the great memes and videos. Um, and he synthesizes the science and says this is the most important investment we can possibly make, and then says, but we're not there yet. We need to be innovating. We need a frontiers of innovation program that's going to really kickstart the R&D and really make us look hard at what's working and what could be working better. Right? And so that's the but or the and, depending on where you, which word you like better. That we're not going to be satisfied and sit back and say, the programs are built. We just need to scale them up or implement them. That's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's the sobering message. There is more to be learned and more to be done. So you guys can tune out for the rest of the talk now. <laughs> um, but I want you to take that. So I don't want you to hear when I say that there are things that maybe aren't as effective. I don't want you to hear, and therefore we shouldn't invest. Therefore, we should go home and, and build another stadium. What I want you to hear is, therefore, it's more pressing than ever that we figure out what does work. Okay. So hopefully, you can hold on to that. Um, let me figure out how to how do I move forward. Okay. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about what we know and and how we can improve children's outcomes. Which green button? <laughs> oh, there we go. All right, so this is exactly um, the graph or, or the figure that Judy showed that showed how early development progresses um, most quickly, uh, starts prenatally, and progresses most quickly in that first year of life, but also those first five years of life, right? And so this is the basis of the argument that she articulated so incredibly well this morning that says that brain architecture creates the platform the foundation for all later learning, right? And so I don't have to say anything more because she said most of it before. Also, she said and talked about the importance of brain experience. Um, what I love about coming to conferences is that when you hear different neuroscientists scientists talk about experience, they highlight different aspects of it. So almost everyone talks about toxic stress. Some of them emphasize language more. Some of them talk about early um, math more, right? And so there's lots of skills that are wired into the brain. There's lots of parts of the brain that develop. Um, and in every instance, there's the underlying principle of use it or lose it, right? Those connections are built. Um, those that are used become stronger over time. Um, and those that are not are uh, pruned over time. Um, where I spend a lot of time thinking about this is in the realm of poverty. Okay, so we know that experience is drastically shaped by family, social, and economic factors. And that's not just because um, of stress, which is where the toxic stress uh, is most often brought up, but it's also because of environmental hazards that matter. It's because of crowding in housing, noise levels. There is a lot of experiences that children have based on uh, the type of income and economic background that they're born into. Um, it sets up a scenario in which simply changing one aspect of the environment um, may make a difference, may not do everything. And so I think we really have to own, um, if we want to close achievement gaps, we have to think broadly about the environments that children are in and really push forward on multiple, uh, multiple frontiers, multiple areas. Um, so what really has propelled my interest in early childhood was not the neuroscience. So when I was coming up in grad school, that wasn't quite uh, out there yet. Um, but it was simply the fact that when you look at young children as they're entering kindergarten, you see large differences by socioeconomic status. So this is using two uh, data sets. They're national data sets. So we can have a conversation about how this would look drastically different in Minnesota because of art scholarships now, <laughs> how things are changing. But I can tell you that a data set of kindergartners from 1998, okay, so they were five in 1988, and then a data set, which is the blue bar, of kindergartners in 2010, so 12 years later, 
okay? And the bars show the difference between kids that are entering school in the bottom 20% of the income distribution or the SES distribution. So those roughly equates to kids who are in poverty, so um, making less than about $20,000, $24,000 a year for a family of three, compared to those that are in the upper 20% of the income distribution. So think over about $100,000. Um, the difference is, is over a standard deviation, now standard deviation probably doesn't mean a lot to most of you, a standard deviation is about the amount of schooling that children year learn in that first year of school, right? So basically what you're showing is that a kid from the bottom in the poverty group, that bottom 20%, is showing up to school, kindergarten, looking a year behind someone who is much more affluent, okay? That's a lot of ground to be covered. <laughs> um, and it's true in both reading and math. It hasn't changed much between 1998 and 2010. Uh, it, it did go down a little bit. Um, but what you'll also see is that the differences in those early reading skills, those early math skills, are much larger than those differences in approaches to learning. And approaches to learning has to do with their ability to focus, work independently, ask for help when they need it, so some of that behavioral stuff, as well as more obviously behavioral stuff, meaning they're acting out in class, they're fighting with other kids. That's the externalizing problems. And internalizing problems is being sad, withdrawn, um, not talking, right? Differences in children's early skills are large. Okay, relative to some of their differences in behavior um, and other things. Now, that doesn't mean that those things aren't important, but it tells you that kids are entering school with very different skill levels. And part of the reason that I found this so important is that we know over time, and this is all of what y'all are going to talk about tomorrow, <laughs> our schooling system does not mitigate those factors. Okay, so they come in looking different in kindergarten. And then those differences persist. And this is very much a glass half full, glass half empty. Are we glad that they're able to keep them apace? Well, you know, only if your counterfactual is that they would have widened drastically, right? So it's, it could be worse, but it could be much better. So this says to me, we have these very large differences before kids walk in the door at school, and it doesn't get better. What better uh, place to look than before they get into school? Let's have them not walk in the same door with such large gaps. And then let's hope that the schools can keep them on pace. Right? So that, that is what I want, the reason that I focus on early childhood. And, and it's the brain science explains why <laughs> they might be walking in the door at five with difference, because they've had different experiences. But this is what really propels me to think we really got to focus there. Because if these, if these pathways started to converge and schools could really make up the ground, um, we might worry less about those early years, but it doesn't look like they do. Um, the other thing we know is that as inequality in our country has increased, so uh, many of you are probably aware that income inequality has increased drastically in the last, oh, 20 so years, um, the differences by income have actually been increasing. And this stands in contrast to differences uh, by race. So race. Uh, differences have been on the decline, but income differences have been increasing. And a lot of those income differences have been the top pulling away from both the sort of working middle class and uh, the bottom, the poverty group, right? So it's an increasingly unequal, increasing disparities by family background in terms of achievement. And this is over time. Um, I'm taking this from Sean Reardon's great work. Um, it's been in the New York Times, so many may have seen this before. But it basically shows that income gap is going up over time, even as the black-white gap um, is going down over time. So people find that surprising sometimes. Um, and again, I want to go back to this question of, of the economic investment perspective. Um, the other reason to care about it is not just that these early skills persist, but they also predict later educational outcomes, and outcomes that we very much care about as a country that wants to be on the cutting edge of economic productivity, right? I don't need to tell the Fed that we are no longer in a world in which a high school degree will get you a good, secure job, right? We're in a skills economy. We're in an information technology economy. If we want productive workers, they need to have the skills that those jobs will demand. And it turns out that the high school degree is probably not as effective as getting you there as it might have once been. 
So what do we know about disparities in those early achievement skills? They're linked to disparities in high school graduation, and they're linked to disparities in college uh, completion. So this is an overtime look at the cohorts. Uh, so it looks like 1993 data, but that's when they turned 14. So they're a little bit older. Um, and what you can see is that there have been gains among low-income children in terms of attending college, attending, uh, uh, graduating from college. But they've gone from 5% to 9%. 9% is not the place we need to be. So that is an entire cohort of low-income children, 9% of which are graduating from college. We can do much better, right? Think of the lost productivity. Think of the workers that aren't trained the way you need them to be to get hired. That's an entire set, an entire cohort of children that are not living up to what I would like to think are our own national um, ideals and standards for how we want our children to turn out. So, uh, there is a good reason and a lot of reason to be focusing on early childhood, other than the brain. <laughs> um, and this just goes to show that, uh, that what I'm going to conclude is that I really think that uh, important focus of early learning programs, which I'm going to get to um, in a few minutes, is really to think about how best to build the early literacy and math skills. I do think socio-emotional development is important. I don't want you to hear me say that's not important. It's important for a lot of uh, important outcomes. Um, but there's a lot more variability in children's early behaviors. And teachers uh, actually do a fairly good job in helping kids adjust over time. Um, I think one of the places where we have not put enough attention um, is helping teachers really think about building not the surface level, math and reading skills, so not just can they count to 20, not just can they do rote um, alphabet knowledge, but can they really learn the concepts? Can they really engage with the material? And I think that is my and and but that I want you to hear. We have more to do to really think about teaching and learning in those early years around um, literacy, around language, around math concepts, and those sorts of things. OK. Um, the yes part, so I'm going to start with the yes part, is uh, colleagues Greg Duncan, myself, Hiri Yashikawa, and Holly Schindler had this great idea back in 2007, which yes, is now 11 years ago, <laughs> that we were going to take a look at all the early learning programs that existed and had been evaluated. Okay, um, And we were going to see what they could teach us about what makes for effective programs. What is it that all the variability, and there were hundreds of them, Right? Like, there are times when I'd be sitting in my office reading a program uh, valuation from something that was started in 1968, and I'd think to myself, I wrote a sentence that sounded just like that. <laughs> People had good ideas, even back then, right? <laughs> um, so we pulled together all of these studies. We coded them all up. It was years of pain for many graduate students. Um, uh, but they, they did it all. And then we looked simply. What are the outcomes of these studies? What do they show us? Um, and here, uh, here is a visual representation of it. So let me um, tell you quickly. So this is the bottom is over time when the evaluation study was published, right? So, so they were thinking about this a lot back in 1965, it turns out. Um, and not only from Head Start. So the red bubbles are Head Start studies. The yellow bubbles are non-Head Start studies. And the bigger circles represent larger programs, more kids enrolled that were studied. And the smaller dots represent small programs, so you know, 50 to 100 kids enrolled as opposed to thousands. Um, so the first thing to note is that almost all of them, so you want to think of zero as being a no-impact program, almost all of them have a program impact. OK, there's a few that are hanging out at zero, but most of them are on the, the upper side. And on top of it, though, there's a lot of variability. OK, and that variability could be due to many things. It could be the communities, the families, the kids, how long the program lasted, uh, the types of teachers that were in the program, the types of training those teachers had gotten, whether the program provided nutritional support. I could go on and on. But the thing to note is yes, on average, positive, important. The average program had a positive impact. But some programs had much larger impacts than others. 
And so the question becomes, what is driving larger impacts? How do you, how do I go? How do you take a program that was closer to the zero and think about moving it further up on that scale to have it have a larger impact? The other thing that you can look at, so this is right when the program ends, you're testing kids, you know, maybe uh, two weeks before the program ends, maybe two weeks after you're looking at, at their outcomes. You can also think about looking at them over time. Okay, and this is one of the, the important questions in the field, is trying to figure out when we get this initial boost, how do we sustain it? How do we either make sure that they continue to perform well over time um, as we enable the kids that weren't in those programs to catch up, but how do we make the case that over time having participated in a program matters? Now, um, healthcare, <laughs> any type of intervention that you think of, you know, whether it's losing weight, smoking cessation, any of these things. In the field of public health, you sort of expect things will decline over time. That what the, the most success you're likely to have is probably at program completion, and then things do tend, you see declining impacts. And that's also the case with early childhood. Um, and I think um, Dale may talk a little bit about this, so now they aren't circles, they're just little dots of each program. This is looking at outcomes over time, and you see they do go down. And this is particularly for the cognitive outcomes, so there are things like high school graduation that may still be positive even if these decline over time. Um, special education tends that we have a paper that shows that special education, high school completion, and a few other things tend to remain, you see long-term impacts on those, but these are just the test scores. Um, and it really says that you know, the conversation that happens today among those of us that are especially interested in early childhood needs to happen in conversation with the tomorrow's panel, right? So it's not just what happens in early childhood, it's what comes later and how those two systems, if they are systems, I'm, I'm kind of cringing as I say that, <laughs> talk to each other, right? So, um, and someone mentioned that preschool development grant, grant. It is all about uh, collaborative systems building. And I think for many people in early childhood, it's, it's, it can be hard to think about what's an effective system. But it's more than just early learning programs. Even working well with other lear early learning programs, it has to involve the later schooling experiences and thinking about how schools, public or private, will build on what happens in that early learning uh, year or two. OK, um, so I want to say something about access and cost. And I think this is the yes part, right? So what I will try and argue is that I just showed you that even um, average programs, so these are not all rock star programs. These are some were public, some were private. Average programs have positive impacts at the program ending. Doesn't mean that they'll necessarily persist in large ways over time, but they're there. So my yes is even getting kids into an average quality program, I'm looking at you, Art, is good. <laughs> It's better than no program at all, okay? But we know that the cost is high, okay? And the fact that the cost is high for even an average program, right? So now I'm not saying the Cadillac uh, educators of the world. I'm talking about your <laughs> average program. The cost is high and not everyone has access. And so the yes part for me is yes, provide, try to provide, think of ways to provide resources to get kids into the programs when their parents want them. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna come and take a kid away from a family and put them in a program if it's not what their parents want. But we know that the demand is there. When programs go universal, there's, there is uptake. Um, so I think it's worth thinking what, about the funding streams that we have. Um, so we have Head Start, that's still the largest program. We have state pre-kindergarten programs. Um, I did a little bit of background research Minnesota, you guys are lagging on this, as I understand it. Public funding, someone can tell me I'm wrong if there's been recent movement. Anyone want to chime in? No? OK. You all are lagging on public funding of pre-kindergarten programs. That may be fine. You might make up for it in other ways. I'm not, but I'm letting you know <laughs> that you're, you're lagging on it. Um, and then CCDBG. And CCDBG provides um, child care subsidies that can be used at private play um, places. Uh, those are the three funding streams. Um, they don't, as you heard from the last panel, they don't always work well together. There are different eligibility criteria, And that really is a focus of the current administration in DC is to try and make systems work better for parents, um, to have that not be so fragmented um, and confusing. 
Um, so it's really important. Um, and I think the good news is that on average, about 70% of kids have at least one year of an early learning program before they get into kindergarten. That's pretty good. But we happen to know that there are particular populations um, that don't get in. So I've already commented that high income uh, parents can pay for it, and they do. Um, we know that it's not just the bottom, it's not just poor children that can't, or poor families that can't afford early learning programs, it's working poor families. And I'll show you some data to suggest that. The bottom three, so the bottom 60% of the income distribution, 60% struggles to be able to afford private pay programs. Why? Because they cost a lot of money. I'm sure you guys know this, you know, 10 to $15,000 a year for a four-year-old. Um, and that's pretty good quality, probably. <laughs> um, the other thing, and I, I was surprised I haven't heard uh, more conversation about uh, these particular populations earlier this morning. Um, we know that there is lower enrollment among uh, Hispanic families, um, immigrant families. There's uh, dual language learners, right? English immersion. Um, there is a lot of concern about the workforce and the industry being able to support and, be, uh, and work with families who are not speaking English and access uh, to programs because of that. So maybe that's not a problem in uh, Minnesota. Maybe you guys have figured this all out. If so, please let us know in Wisconsin uh, what to do. Because it's really, because <laughs> it's really important. Uh, you know, it will be a majority minority country in not that many years. Um, and as far as I can tell, most of us spend our time thinking about people that speak English um, and come from a background that is English speaking. And that's not going to be the frontier of early childhood in just a handful more years. Um, Rural populations, so there's already been some mention of that and I was really uh, grateful to hear that. We need to figure this out in Wisconsin too and I'll show you some data. It is, um, it is the largest sort of under enrollment group and it's, I believe it's a question of scale. I believe it's a question of more of scale and uh, supply than demand, but it could be both. And I think it's just really important that we uh, find a way to think more coherently about that. In Wisconsin, um, in Richland County, there's this company called Organic Valley. Many of you probably, do you guys buy their yogurt and their milk? We're very proud of them. Um, tremendous workforce issues. They can't recruit and retain workers because there's very few uh, childcare facilities or opportunities. And when you're recruiting someone to come work and they have kids, saying, but wait, we can find your neighbor to watch your kid after school, apparently isn't a grand selling point. Um, <laughs> So we're starting to have conversations with uh, rural development grant people trying to find funding to help build facilities that can operate on a smaller scale, right? So when you're in an urban area, you can have a program that becomes economically viable because it serves 75 kids. Um, you're never gonna get 75 kids from Organic Valley uh, fields. So, but you could get 30 maybe. So thinking outside of the box, working with businesses to try and understand, that seems super important. Um, Okay, so here's my graph. This is the CPS data. I think it was similar to what Stephanie showed. Um, the line actually, um, some people connect it as, as was done in the earlier graph. It's a change in question, and so that's why you see a jump up, because the question is asked more broadly. Um, but the bottom three lines, the sort of olive, the green dot, and the blue, that's the bottom 60% of the income distribution. And these are three and four year olds. And so what that tells you is that it's not just a question of people who are at the very bottom. It's not just a poverty question. It's a pretty broad question of being able to afford $10,000, $12,000 out of your income to send your kid to a formal early learning program. And you can see how the uh, top income quintile, that's the red dashed line, is by far, um, in the higher. And it goes to the point that when people have resources, they will spend it on their children or spend it on putting their children in these programs. Um, this is some data on uh, rural programs just to show you. So you can see about 80% of urban and suburban kids are in programs. Um, just focus on the blue line, but only uh, less than 50% of rural kids are accessing these programs in the year at age four. Okay, so that is the yes. Invest, your average program will have a positive impact on these kids' early uh, literacy and math skills. But then I wanna push you on what more do we need to know to make the programs better so that they're not just average programs having average impacts, but that we're getting much more out of those early years 
um, and having better outcomes. And here I'm gonna tell you some things that we think might be very important and some things that we now think are maybe not as important. So I'll be fair and balanced in my treatment. <laughs> Um, so one of the things we were able to look at in our data was whether programs that started earlier and lasted longer would have larger impacts, right? So one perspective is if you get a pretty good impact for a year or two at age three and four, let's get them in there at six months and keep them there till age five or six, till they're going into formal school. And our short answer, um, what you want to see is these are mostly flat lines. So starting much, much earlier, right? So... Um, or going much longer doesn't actually add a lot of value, okay? So enrolling babies in early learning programs, these are typically center-based programs, just to give you some context. It's not home visiting, it's not parent support, it's not power, parent empowerment. It's a more structured early learning and program. Doesn't seem to be the most effective way to get a more effective program. For There's two effectives in that sentence, but I think you got my point. Um, we did see, however, if you looked at the data a little bit differently, that when you focus on getting kids in at age two or three, so that's a medium length program, not all five years, but if you get them in at age two or three, that does have a larger impact than starting later and also than starting earlier, okay? Um, you can follow up with questions about why I think that is. There's certainly some sensitivity. Language is coming on board during those years. It comes on board much earlier, but there's a lot of growth in language during those years. Um, it may be that that is the optimal age to put 10 kids together in a classroom, and that when they're much younger, <laughs> putting 10 kids together or six kids together in an infant-toddler classroom is a lot harder to manage. So uh, there could be program implementation reasons. So ages two and three. Um, the other thing that looked particularly um, helpful in having a program have more impact is looking at curricular enhancements. So again, I'm somewhat surprised that there hasn't been a lot of discussion about when you say curriculum for early learning programs, what are you talking about, <laughs> right? So um, it actually matters what happens in the classroom, and I know Dale's going to touch on this more, but uh, when you use developmentally appropriate trajectory-related learning curriculum, you get a lot more out of a uh, program, okay? So what is being implemented, how the teacher is structuring the time in the classroom, all of that matters, and in many ways, um, this is not surprising. So I think all of us have some notions, because we're in this early childhood space, or, or if you're in higher ed, maybe you could imagine being in an early childhood space, where you could come up with some good lesson plans around teaching kids their letters or their, or their numbers, and it could, you could use Simon Say so it would be fun, and you can use the hawk and the you know, different noises and sounds, and it would be really great. But then there becomes the question of, okay, you've taught them a few sounds. How often do you have to review those sounds for them to actually learn it. Do you wait a week? Is that too long? Is that not long enough? Should you revisit the H sound five times over the course of the year? Or will they get bored? When you actually start to sit down and think, what would it mean to plan a curriculum that would engage kids, that would help them learn, and that a teacher could feasibly implement in a busy, loud, fun classroom, it is much harder than you might realize. And that's not to say that there aren't lots of opportunities for natural learning and that kids are not sponges that absorb it all, but it is to say that like a planned, thoughtful curriculum that takes seriously the idea that there are learning trajectories can do a lot towards improving program outcomes. Um, the other thing that we were able to look at, and we looked at this, I'm not showing you the data behind this, but we looked at this in the, the database that we have, and it, this is where I got those numbers. So that's like half a year of learning. Um, we also looked about uh, class size reduction. This is another, um, sounds like a good structural marker of program quality. Smaller classes must be better. Um, and we did, I'm not going to explain the graph too much, except to say, um, it turns out that when classes aren't super large, when you're not talking about going from a classroom of 30 uh, four-year-olds down to one of 18, right? So almost all classes these days are between 15 and 20. You have to get really small in that classroom to see a benefit, right? So you're talking now of ratios that are like one to five for four-year-olds, which uh, I'll say is economically almost impossible to, to carry. So, one of the ways that I would say is not a great way to think about trying to improve program outcomes is drastically shrinking class sizes. Um, it just doesn't seem to add that. 
Uh, this one should get some booze. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Parent engagement efforts. Now, I want to be really careful here. On average, we found that parent engagement activities did not boost the effectiveness of programs for kids' uh, literacy and math outcomes. Most of the parent engagement programs that we coded were light touch programs. Okay, So they were not heavily developed curriculum that thoughtfully thought about how to engage with parents and help them model positive um, uh, strategies for teaching and learning within the home, right? So those sort of more built out programs actually did show some signs of effectiveness, but 90% of the programs that early learning programs engage in with parents um, are not those programs. They're not spending their resources in sort of heavy touch uh, intensive programs with parents. They tend to be much lighter workshops, one home visit a year, maybe two. And those added nothing to program effectiveness. Um, they may bring along some other things. There may be reasons you would want a program to do this nonetheless. Um, but you didn't see it in the kids' outcomes. Um, I think I have 24 seconds left. Is that, what that, is that right? OK. And I have one more point, so I get to make it and run off the stage before getting booed again. Um, the other thing that we have seen, and this is, not, this is in my own work but also across the field, is increasingly high requirements for teacher or provider education um, don't seem to add value to children's outcomes. Now let me step back and say there are, again, many other reasons why you might want to use education as a way to professionalize the field. Um, and it's clear that the difference between no early childhood education training or skills and some is really important. But a lot of state policies really parse, um, it parse provider education into credits. So if you're at six credits, you qualify for this. If you're at 12 credits of early childhood, you get an added boost for that. And the evidence to suggest that additional credits um, and degrees really have a, a strong or even meaningful relationship with children's outcomes um, just hasn't been there. That's not to say that skill doesn't matter. That's not to say that professional development doesn't matter or that training doesn't matter. But it's saying that simply focusing on an educational credential as a, as a way to push forward program effectiveness um, is not a good idea. So I believe I'm done. That just summarizes what I've said. So I'm next. No. You're passing the baton? I am, but I think someone has to change the slides from behind. Otherwise, you have to give my talk. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> now for more bad news. Um, so <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to be somewhat different. I'm on, right? Yeah. I knew somebody would turn me on. Great. OK, I'm going to be somewhat different from the talks you've heard today, I'm going to get really quite specific about the research we've been doing in Tennessee and the lessons that we might be able to draw from it. Um, and um, so, uh, so, there, so when we started this, my colleague Mark Lipsy and I, uh, some years ago, and working very collaboratively with the Tennessee Department of Education, there was enormous support for pre-K intervention. And those of you who don't know me, wouldn't, might not realize that I had 10 years at the Abyssidarian Project program. Uh, I was a researcher with them for 10 years. I've been in the early childhood field all my life. My mother thought it was very boring because I never did anything else, but I've never been bored. I loved it. So we had every expectation that when we did this first randomized control trial of a statewide implemented pre-K program, we would have support for the effort that everybody wanted to make anyway. So what we realized when you really start looking into this, people ought, I, those are quotes, deep research base. Well, this deep research base derives from, a, from small boutique studies that were conducted 50 or more years ago and were in a single place. So even when you look at Catherine's data that long-term effects, by definition, those long-term effects, if you want to look at them, have to have come from programs that started much earlier, right? At a different point in time. They were not statewide implemented programs. Um, but it's very appeal, appealing, because the achievement gap has, has grown, as, as we've seen all morning, and as Catherine just shown, 
So the idea that maybe we don't have to really fix K-12, we can just make kids better prepared when they go into school, and then they'll be all inoculated against sort of poor education in K-12. Um, and, you know, but that's a very appealing argument. I mean, <laughs> Philadelphia passed a soda tax to do that very thing, and I know the Philadelphia schools. Um, so Heckman and others have promised states immediate and long-term benefits for programs for four-year-olds. All of Heckman's analyses were done on the Perry Project, a little bit on the Abyssinian Project, both of which I've said to you, neither of which is being implemented today. Not anything like either of those is being implemented in states today. And I want to argue with you, no, I don't want to argue with you. I want to assert to you that pre-K is a concept. We don't have a vision. People all nod their heads when you say pre-K. But then if you sat them down in a room and say, well, what do you mean by that? You might have the Minnesota model. You might have all sorts of different ideas about what pre-K is. And I'm going to argue that pre-K is not pre-K is not pre-K. But it's been easier for us just to use that term and get the public on board with us. So we, Tennessee Voluntary Pre-K Program is a typical statewide pre-K, no matter what you've heard out in the media. We are very typical. We started in 1998 with a small pilot program. Uh, we created, the state legislature created the voluntary pre-K program in 20, 2005, so we were a little bit late to the game. Um, but the current program ha is statewide and has pre-K classrooms in all 130, well, 30, 135 of Tennessee's school systems. We serve 18,000 children. It's, t it's a targeted program, so you have to be eligible for free and reduced price lunch, or you have to meet some other criteria, risk criteria like homelessness or things like that. When we started, we met nine of the ten near benchmarks. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are friends with Steve Barnett, but he is quickly backtracking away from this because he hasn't liked the fact that we did meet those. But, but states... That's about all they had to go by when they were thinking about quality programs was to go to the near benchmarks, most of which are based on the things that Catherine just talked about that are structural, class size, teacher education, those kinds of things. Um, but we had no central enforceable vision for pre-K, and I would argue with you, to, no, to you, that most states don't have a central enforceable vision, and we had no coaching or professional Fund, development funding that followed that vision and had follow through. Those are expensive. People would rather fund programs in the public schools than they would to actually provide money for those kinds of things because they cost. So what do we need to know? We need to know the immediate post-treatment effects, school readiness on emergent literacy, language, and math skills, classroom behaviors, and social skills. We need to know, moreover, how sustainable these are because state legislators really don't mean they only want kids prepared to go into kindergarten. They have bought the idea that if you prepare them to go into kindergarten, they will close the achievement gap later, right? That's, that's, they believe that. So they don't only want kids prepared to go into, go into school. And I've come to believe that we really need to know then what enhancements to the program could have the greatest potential for improving effectiveness. And since I'm now, art is my hero, um, effectiveness of alternate models. We have not done the kinds of studies where we actually look at the effectiveness of alternate models. And I was just saying to Art earlier that I was very distressed when the preschool development grant was funded that there was zero money and all those millions that were spent to even collect information on what the various states did with the money they got. And if you wanted to compare programs and try to see, well, maybe, maybe First Class Alabama is really a great pre-K program. They actually have a vision, and they follow through with monitoring, and they follow through with coaching. If, they have, if they're more effective, shouldn't someplace like Tennessee don't, don't get me started. Okay, we'll talk about that. Okay, so we were funded in 2009. We had three main, we had, I'm not even talking about one of the main components, so I'm sorry I left it off and I left it at three. But we were a randomized control trial of oversubscribed schools. We have two cohorts. It took two cohorts to get school districts to learn what randomization meant. Um, 
So we have 2,990 2, students that we are following through the state database who were randomly assigned uh, to, eat, uh, from, to be a waiting list control. I mean, they were, either were on the waiting, they were, sorry, their uh, application lists were randomized and they, they got in in the order in which we randomized the list. And so it, people who didn't get in were now a waiting list control. But we didn't want to wait until third grade to find out what happened to these kids, which is when the state database kicks in. So we actually convinced a thousand of those parents to consent to have their children assessed through the early grades. And it's about 700, 300, 700 who were in the treatment and 300 who were in control. We've now been following those kids up through middle school and we're in the process of writing a new proposal to follow them through high school. Uh, it's due very soon. Um, so I need to go home. When, um, so, um, so and, and in that follow-up, we're also we're following a, what we call an intensive stuff study follow-up, um, which is a little bit different from the other one, but that's too complicated. Okay. So, okay. When we, when, we put this work, when we put this information out, we were heroes. I'm telling you, I felt like Jesus. They would throw flowers and we would ride the, <laughs> ride the donkey into town. So uh, random, random assignment, uh, an effect size of 0.32, which doesn't sound terrific, except I also have Catherine's. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, Greg gave it to me. Catherine didn't even know I had it. So, uh, so where do we stand with that? We're, we're, we're right there. So what she didn't point out to you is that since the Abecedarian and Perry project, we haven't hit that one standard deviation effect since. It's been going steadily down, right? But we don't look different in our immediate effects from all the other programs. Um, so, but, let me back up. Unfortunately for us, because it's been very difficult, uh, unfortunately for us, we were a longitudinal study. We didn't stop with immediate effects. So, um, so there's, a, there's our immediate effects. That, now, this is a composite, and I want to talk about that for just a minute in terms of something that, that Catherine was just talking about. So there's our immediate effects. Um, so we have this you know, nice thing. 60%, sorry, 60 of our control group stayed home. It's a rural state. There are not a lot of child care out there. So 60% of ours were in some sort of parent care, relative care. I mean, they were not in a group care situation. Um, and guess what happened? So we don't, whoops, I didn't mean to. So we don't have, you could call it a fade out. Maybe that trajectory is, you know, shifting a little bit. But mostly what you had is immediate catch up. So the Head Start Puma and the Head Start Impact Study says it took the control group two, uh, one year to learn what the, what the treatment group had learned in two. And so, so that was, you know, a little alarming, and, but, 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 you know, people have found that, that there's catch up and, and the impact has faded. What began to distress us was in second grade to see the control group moving ahead, which continued into third grade. Now, so what's really interesting about the, the, this effect here, because then now we're talking about a composite, is a lot of that composite was being driven by what people call constrained skills, letters and numbers. So letter word identification and applied problems, which is what a lot of people use to assess their immediate impact. Those are very constrained skills. We didn't see such an effect on vocabulary. We saw hardly any effect on vocabulary. We didn't see much of an effect on oral comprehension or on quantitative concepts, which is a more, more conceptual assessment of math. So what you're seeing is a lot of these programs can drive uh, enhancements in those very, what, what you would think of as rudimentary school readiness skills, what Drew Bailey talks about kids are going to learn anyway. Um, and, and so these kids learn them very quickly. And then, and then began to move ahead in terms of other skills. So now at the end of third grade, this is the full sample. This is the state test that's given to everybody at the end of third grade. We see uh, effects that are not what people want. 
So this is not significant. This is reading. This, this math and science, and this is the control group outperforming the, on the full sample. People believe for a while that, well, it's just something was really odd about our consented sample, and when we get the full sample, we'll see, we'll see those miraculous pre-K effects that people expect. Well, we don't. And I need to tell you now that the fifth and sixth grade data are in, the effects are getting stronger. And now reading is significantly, uh, significantly negative for, the, for those who had VPK. Why is this? Well, one of the reasons might be these are disciplinary offenses by the end of third grade. And what you see is that this is the control, this is the treatment group, this is the control group. So you begin to see that, well, thank heavens, in third grade, this is cumulative disciplinary offenses. You don't have a lot. <laughs> it gets worse, I'm telling you. But you don't have a lot. But what you have is about twice the rate for those kids who had been in the treatment group who had had er an early year in the public schools uh, of, of a pre-K treatment now look like they're violating more of these school rules. Now, what are school rules? Most of you know this. They're wearing your hat backwards, not tucking in your shirt speaking bad. It looks like an anti-authority sort of things. That these are violations that wouldn't get you arrested on the street, but schools don't like them. We didn't get differences, thank heavens, at this point in major offenses, that is bringing a bomb to school. Um, and sadly, by fifth grade, we're getting significant differences now in both of these. So, Everybody says, oh, okay, we got, we've got to, it's very hard to, to account for something when you didn't hypothesize it was going to happen. Uh, so, so, but lots of people are full of lots of ideas. One of the, well, one of them I won't even entertain, which is that the, the Tennessee program is somehow this sort of uh, isolated program with a moat around it, and no other programs in the, in the country are like it. That's just simply not true. I mean, we are a statewide implemented program that show the same effects as most of the programs these days are showing, at least immediately. And most places don't have follow-up data. So the other possibility is maybe kindergarten teachers are working really closely with the kids who come in lower skilled, and they're ignoring the kids with high skills. And all I want to say to you is, have you been in kindergarten classrooms lately? <laughs> I have. The other thing is maybe the kindergarten grades are not building on the skills the VPK children came to school with, so the momentum is not sustained. I would like to make, I'd like to say here, and then I'll come back to it, that perhaps the issue is the pre-K programs have not uh, impacted those skills that are likely to be sustained and built on. So if it's just constrained skills that are being implemented, it, unfortunately in a very didactic way in these classrooms, that does not prepare children to be great learners with a depth of language and oral com and comprehension skills and better understanding of math that might carry them forward. So the other possibility is that maybe pre-K has become a junior kindergarten experience by insisting that this money be funneled through the public schools the public schools, if you go into an elementary school, they're, they have a certain way of working with K-6. They're really not used to working with four-year-olds. They're probably not even great environments for five-year-olds, but they're certainly not good environments for four-year-olds. The whole system is not set up for these. They don't, when we're doing this evaluation of the pre-K, the uh, pre, uh, preschool development grant expansion, and in Memphis, where they keep the kids in classrooms for seven hours a day, 48% of the classrooms never go outside or to the gym. These are four-year-olds who are in a classroom seven hours a day who never go outside. Now, they tried to tell, this is Memphis, they tried to tell me, well, it's too cold. I thought, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, all right, so I had my uh, observers the next year write down the temperature. Um, so, don't, don't, fool, don't fool with me. Um, so I, I, it's, it's because the vision by default has become these kids, and, and we fed into it, these kids are behind. What we need to do with these kids is sit them down and drill them. 
so they catch up, so they're ready. Forgetting that what actually is needed is a much more complex development in young children that has to do with language and executive function skills and comprehension and emotional control and lots of other things that you don't necessarily get by sitting. In some classrooms, we see kids sit 79 minutes at a time in whole group instruction. OK, so all right, my 12 minutes. OK, I've got, I'm going to do it. Um, so my problem with, so now, now what people are saying, especially in response to these findings, is, well, we didn't mean pre-K. We meant high-quality pre-K. I said, OK, let's sit in the room and you define high quality for me. Uh, you, there's no better definition for high quality than there is for pre-K. So um, the, it's vague. And most use structural features like group size and teacher-child ratio and licensed teacher and use of a curriculum. But so far, none of these features, individually or collectively, are associated with children's achievement gains. Most of those targeted, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking my finger at you, most of those targeted curricula have been math that have shown some of the effects. And so, and, and, and maybe some literacy ones. But we, we haven't seen, and plus, anyway, OK. Stop there. All right, here we go. So most of the classic measures we have, have it, uh, are based on ratings. They're based on being in the classroom a very short period of time, and you rate what's going on. And, and they also have not been shown. They're, they're, they're difficult. They're difficult to use. They're difficult to stay reliable with. Training is expensive. Um, but they really account for very little variance in child gain. But they're all people have. And so they're part of the QRIS in most, in most states because what else are they going to use? Um, so my, I, ha I have a system that we've been using since the late 80s that's a behavioral count. Um, so it looks at time use, which is very appealing to policymakers. Um, it, but it looks at interaction counts. These are more difficult to collect. I'm going to show you that they may be more predictive of child gains, and I think they're more amenable to coaching. If we really wanted to improve what's going on in these classrooms, it's going to require serious effort uh, that's different from what we've been doing. Um, so I've, I've been collecting these data in several large scales. I use a I'll go quick deal. OK, so in, in 2014, when the first data came out, this, shockingly, the superintendent of schools at, in Metro Nashville came to me and said, come help us make a, a, a visionary preschool. I said, serious? He said, yeah, yeah, so OK. Um, so the goals were, but I don't necessarily think they knew what that meant, but the goals were that we were going to have this data-driven change process and that we would, we would work in partnership with them to figure out so what would make a better vision for a pre-K albeit within the public schools. I mean, those are the constraints we have. We worked really hard. That's all that shows. Um, so, so we want to look at how time is spent. You can use something called the narrative record. Um, so let me show you what you can look at. So um, with the narrative record, you can see how time was spent. So these, this is the first year. You had, this is minutes. You had 50 minutes in whole group, nine minutes in small group. I've just done the data where Teachers talk 80% of the time in whole group. They talk 88% of the time in small group. It's not used as a way that they can really listen to children. OK, so then 100 minutes in centers, they specials, 68 minutes of the day in transitions, 35 in mealtime, and 97 in nap. So, nap. so if you look at this, half of the six and a half hour days is spent um, basically not doing very much. And the only thing you could really change would be this part, right? Because you do have to eat, and you do have, and I suppose it's four-year-olds, it's not necessarily nap that much, but you do have to eat. Uh, so we also looked at what, what uh, now, I will tell you, these data do not look like what we're getting from the preschool development grant. Hardly any time is being spent in centers anymore. Most of it's being spent in whole group instruction a lot in transitions. Um, so in terms of content covered, the most, there's center content, which is just, a, it, because it's center-based, it's a mix of content. Reading readiness is the most didactically taught. And most of that is on literacy, foundational literacy skills. Um, then you have um, 
where are we? Math, three, three minutes on average. So, so here's preschool activities provided to the whole class. Um, and let's see. All right, now, okay, follow me. This is on average now 61 minutes in whole group, 12 minutes in small group, and down here you get 67 minutes in transition. They insisted they were doing a lot of instruction in transition, so we actually pull that out. It's three minutes. Um, they insisted they were, that there was tons of instruction going on in mealtimes. Well, there's one minute out of it. And 84 minutes in nap. In terms of content, again, you're back to that none. And math, seven minutes. Liter reading readiness, 34 minutes. And center content, 116. But what you see is the heavy emphasis on literacy. And two of the classrooms did any math. All right. So I have to be fast. Um, so my child observation of preschools and the teacher observation in preschool is a behavioral count measure. We're there from the beginning of the classroom till the end of the day, and we're sweeping the classroom. So I'll look first at Stephanie and record what she's doing. Then I'll look at Aaron and record what he's doing, and then I'll look at Art and record what he's doing. How do we do this? It's, I can tell you anytime you want to know. We, we, we write down a lot of information about kids and teachers in terms of how they look, and our worst case scenario is when they're all in standard school attire. So, um, okay. So this is the system we use. It's, it's all digital. And so that just give me an interest in, in idea of what we can get. So it, teachers are spending, uh, whenever it's excluding nap, teachers are spending about 35% of the day in instruction, about 26% of the day in managing. All right, I'm going to go around to here. Uh, administration in Tennessee is checking for tornado warnings. Um, so, but you get 9% of, of the day being spent in behavior disapproving and 4 in approving. There's very clearly the, the stick is more important than the carrot, about twice as important. Okay, so, we had, so um, when we were doing this work, we gave, someday I'll tell you, if you want to know how sausage is made, I'll tell you how, com I'm, I have learned so much from this, and mostly as trying to get rid of my hubris about how things should work. All right, so, um, but what we discovered was that there was variability in games that, te that children made. There was variability among classrooms and time spent. And our goal then was to see if there was a relationship to get started on what this vision should be. So we only had 26 classrooms. So if we went with significance level, we weren't going to get very far. So we decided, well, we'll look at the effect sizes. And we'll say anything that's a 0.2 to a 0.4 effect size is important, and particularly if it affects more than one domain, one more, more than one outcome, all right? Um, so here they are. There were eight. Spending less time in transitions. Uh, higher quality of instruction. What does that mean? All right, I'm going to give my quick lesson about an, uh, uh, instruction in a pre-K pre classroom. Almost anything in early childhood is called instruction if you're interacting with a child and materials. So if I'm sitting with you and we're making a card for mother, which would be a lovely thing for Mother's Day, and I'm just helping you put the glue on, that's a one, right? If I say to you, what color is this glitter? That's a two. It's a known answer question. And you have to tell me it's red or it's blue or whatever. If, and it would be lovely, if I should say to you, this glue is sticky. What else is sticky? That's a three and everybody would cheer. If I said to you, and, and yeah, that's right. That's right, syrup is sticky, but I bet we can think of even more things that are sticky. That's a four. I can count on two hands the number of fours we've ever seen in these classrooms. Um, so, but, but, but even despite that, having a little bit more, a little higher quality of instruction was related to more gains for children. Having a more positive emotional climate, that is less disapproval, more approval, and a more positive teacher tone. 
we rate the teacher tone um, every time we see her, and we had to we have to really train our observers not to just rate flat all the time because I guess teaching is very serious, and so teachers are really flat all the time. But if you just lean forward and raise your eyebrows, we give you a four. So, um, <laughs> listening to children. How often are teachers actually listening to children? You can't differentiate instruction if you don't listen to children. If you're talking all the time and you don't listen to children. Greater sequential activities are activities in, during center time that actually have a series of steps. A puzzle is a good, a good example of a sequential activity. More time in associative interactions. Associative interactions are among children are the, most, are the only time they really get to talk. Uh, higher levels of involvement by children and more math opportunities. Those are the things that showed up being related to games. And only one of those eight was actually a time use measure, less time in transition. So the, they, the MNPS, Metro National Schools, call these the magic eight, which is very appealing to them. Um, so at the end of the next year, by focusing on these things, we were able to reduce transitions. We were able to get a slightly, more, a slightly better ratio between disapproval and approval. And we were able to slightly increase teacher listening. At the end of four years of working with them, we never moved the needle on quality of instruction. We never got away from didactic, known answer questions. We never got more sequential activities. We didn't get more associative interactions going on. We didn't get higher levels of involvement by children, probably because the things to do in the classrooms were not that involving, and the kinds of conversations they were having with teachers were not that involving. We couldn't get more math going on. They wanted us to add more in-depth literacy instruction, so we did, uh, but we didn't see that either. Um, so. What, what we're going to do now, we just got funding from the National Science Foundation, is to create a practical tool for coaches and principals that's based on these eight, now nine, where um, working with coaches has been really interesting. Um, that's another story. Um, but um, So we're going to create this web-based portal where uh, you don't go in like Class or Eckers and do all eight or nine of these at one time. You say, I, I'm going to work on transitions with my teacher. And the portal tells you, well, when do you have to be there and for how long do you have to remain in order to, and then we'll clock the amount of transition. Or I'm going to work on behavior disapprovals, you know, this time. And so it shows you how to do that. And it also then gives you some resources for how to work with your teacher if you're trying to bring down behavior disapprovals. Um, But we replicated this. We just did a study of 100 kindergarten classrooms um, into which children from pre-K had matriculated. Uh, they were enrolled. Uh, this is all still in Metro National Schools. And we found, we replicated the, these eight, nine practices. But we also found almost complete redundancy, as people have said, between what was being taught at the end of pre-K in terms of foundational literacy skills and what's being taught at the beginning of kindergarten. And neither, in neither place were teachers working on vocabulary or, or, writing with, or writing or beginning to write with meaning or speaking, communicating. So we didn't see those higher level literacy skills being uh, implemented in either, in either location. That's it. So if you want to know about the magic eight, you can go there. We have all our materials there. We have all the professional development materials we've been developing. Uh, we have some justification for why these eight should be important. If you want to know about our pre-K effects through third grade, um, that was just out this, this past August. Thank you. We keep these on. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. Stuck. All right, if you are like me, you are probably a little sad. Um, <laughs> and also a little bit angry, maybe. 
um, uh -oh. upset. Well, just because of, um, you know, we know so much about young children. And then there are things like keeping four-year-olds inside for, um, for hours. So um, I know some of you. And I'm at the lab school, like I said earlier. Uh, my focus there is working with young children between two and five and also pre-service teachers. So we have uh, teachers in our undergraduate and our Master's of Education courses. And um, I focus on working with the teachers to prepare them to work with young children today. So we do a lot of implicit bias training. We do a lot of developmentally appropriate practice, which was lacking in some of the, the programs that you mentioned. Um, and my personal focus is nature-based education, which was also lacking from mm -hmm. most of these programs. So one thing we know about nature-based programming is that it's the fastest growing area of early childhood right now. We've gone from six programs in 2000 to over 300 today. Um, it's growing quickly. We're not preparing teachers fast enough for it. Uh, I did just release a book on that topic uh, last week or two weeks ago. And, um, and it really focuses on developmentally appropriate and inclusive education. So thank you so much, both of you, for what you shared today. Um, I get to ask the first question, but I know people have many, many questions because these are really wonderful looks at, at what you are studying and what we have found out is working and what will work in the future. So I was really excited about um, the Magic 8 or the Magic <laughs> 9. Um, and I was also really excited about what you found didn't work as far as teacher education and preparation. So I was wondering if you could talk about some of the outcomes that you found that you measure that might help us prepare better teachers uh, in the future to either Catherine or Dale. So I, I am in a teaching and learning department at, um, at Vanderbilt and um, um, we call it sort of handmade teachers because it's not it's not a very large teacher education program as you might as you probably have at Minnesota, mm -hmm. um, but even so, I think a lot of the effort is. Um, uh, I mean, I think that our attempts to have teachers understand something about the development of math and literacy and so forth are are better than most. But I think very few teachers are prepared for the sort of how you have to engage young children. There's, it's, it, most of the preparation seems to involve sort of more didactic interactions with children and sort of what you're going, what you're going to cover, not what do children know and then how do you build on what they know and how do you find out what they know. Um, and um, so, I, yeah, I think we have a long way to go. I think that's why Catherine's finding that that regardless of what kind of degree you had, if you had more child development training, you, that's the only place you saw any effect, mm -hmm. right, yeah. well, on quality. Um, and I think it's, there's, a, there's some sort of underlying context to the, the type of question. So um, public schools, you have licensed teachers, right? right? And so um, these are often students who are taking on debt right but they can afford a little bit more if they're in a public school so when you have mixed delivery systems of pre-k programs right very rarely are the teachers with the degrees that are in community-based programs paid at the same scale that the public school right. teachers are okay. so you're thinking not just maybe in your center they're paid as much but um, so you're thinking not only about a workforce that you want to be educated and skilled who comes out with a degree and is then underpaid, you know, relative to other things that they could be doing underpaid. So it's, there, there's a complexity with sort of what is the expectation about what someone earning 13 or $14 an hour um, is actually going to be able to produce in terms of outcomes. And then the sort of, you can get into the planning time and the preparation time and all of that as well. So it's, I completely agree that the frontier is trying to figure out how do you build best practices, um, but recognizing that it's within a system that's under-resourced, yep. right? And so you're trying to do, I know um, in uh, my community in Wisconsin, uh, when they're in the public schools, their access is to professional development opportunities that aren't appropriate for young children, right? Because they're in a K through, you know, eighth grade or sixth grade school. And what the fourth grade teachers need is not what those teachers need. But they don't, they haven't figured out how to bring all the pre-K teachers together. So it's, it's, it's complicated. And there's a lot of 
opportunity, that's the, <laughs> that's the positive spin, I think, to think about how we're educating um, our teachers. But I, just to add to that, as I completely agree with you, and, and given that, the pressure, because I, I, I was working with Head Start when the pressure started coming to Head Start to mm -hmm. be more academic, mm -hmm. is if you don't provide some serious coaching and help on how to be academic but non-didactic, yeah. academic becomes negative. Yeah. And, and it becomes, you know, drilling children. And, uh, and I mean, but, but you wouldn't expect teachers necessarily to know how to do that except by default what they experienced themselves when they were in fourth grade or whatever. Right. I think that also goes a long way when we talked earlier or someone was speaking earlier about recruitment and especially for professionals of color um, or uh, professionals that are Native American and how do we get them into the field when it is such a, a low pay mm -hmm. um, and they may have to take on a lot of debt. So I think that goes to our workforce problem too. Um, okay, I really want to ask more questions, but uh, I will open it up to the audience so that you can ask some questions. Hi, I'm curious with the Tennessee Pre-K program. You mentioned that you were able to identify the share of your um, non-treated group who were in parental care. And I'm curious if your sample was large enough to even be able to compare between those three groups. Because it seemed to me in the Magic 8, the thing that occurred to me is, well, if you're a parent of just a handful of kids, it's a lot easier to spend time listening because you don't have uh, the same sort of managerial pressures and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm curious if you had a large enough sample and if you saw anything interesting going on there. Okay, so you have to not tell Mark that I answered your question because, Mark, it will be... I looked at that because I was very curious, and Mark immediately slapped my hand and said, we did not randomly assign them to stay home. Uh, so uh, those are the ones that are driving the better effect. Those kids look be best off. The ones that were home? Mm-hmm. So one of the things we're contemplating doing in Minnesota is focusing on a CDA, the Child Development um, Credential. And so I'd be really interested in hearing what you think about um, if we were to focus on a developmentally appropriate CDA for our teachers, is that a good thing? <laughs> do you want to take this one or do you want to? Um, so the, and let me just make sure. So when you say the CDA, do you mean the portfolio-based assessment? I think that's a 60-hour, isn't it? Right, the 60-hour. 20? 100. 120. Oh, 120. 120 now. Okay. okay. Um, uh, and your question is, is that good for pre-K? Is that good for which programs? Wouldn't that be good for children? <laughs> um, it would be better than having no training or background. Yes. So <laughs> if that's that your question? <laughs> well, and so, so there's, a, there's another issue about that, which has to do with the early childhood labor force. Yeah. So when I was at UNC Greensboro, we actually did an articulation agreement between the, more than you want to know, but between the community college and the, and, and the four-year colleges, so that if you were an early childhood graduate in, in, for two years in the community college, Actually, the CDA gets you, can get you into the community college. There is a sort of way to get into the community college that way. It's been very difficult to articulate between the community colleges in early childhood and four-year colleges. We, we have really got to get our the CDA, the community colleges, and the higher ed together so that people can feel there is a career ladder. So if they get one thing, that'll help them on the way to another thing and on the way to another thing. They don't have to go all the way up. But the idea that there is this sort of connected ladder is really yeah. important and doesn't exist now in most places. Yeah, so in Wisconsin we have the registry, which is, are people familiar with that, which is an articulated a career ladder. I think where it runs into problems is it starts making sort of differential, uh, differentiates between 12 credits and, and 10 credits. And that's where you don't see differences in terms of kids' outcomes. So let me just go back to say, like, yes, having some knowledge and experience and training in early childhood is much better than having just a degree that's unrelated or a high school degree, 100%. I think, you know, 
I think the question becomes, what is the quality of supervision that people get when they're in the field? Right, so um, most models have people in a field with a experienced teacher. Some of those teachers are gonna be amazing. Some of those teachers are not gonna be great, right? And so um, our ability to really understand how good that training is, I think is, is a lot looser. I'm in the field of social work and we have a similar problem. I mean, almost all professional fields where you're doing training in uh, agency, um, and, and I'm not saying the professors would do a better job, I'm merely saying that like it's a very, unmonitored process, and what's looked at is sort of this end result. Does that make sense? K-12 has the same problem. You can talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Um, I want to thank you both for your, is this on? Okay. Uh, for your presentations, they were <laughs> very enlightening and <laughs> alarming. Um, We're never getting invited back. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, it's important. I just wanted to, circle back so that uh, I'm clear on what you s what you were saying about the teachers in the pre-k programs particularly the the uh, Dale's presentation are am I correct that a lot of the teachers in the pre-k programs did not have pre-k training like their their four-year degree training was not in pre-k they were all they all had to be licensed teachers and to teach in pre-k you had to ha either be, a, be licensed in early childhood or you had to have an early childhood endorsement. Now that endorsement, sadly, can come with a summer's worth of you know, two six-week six classes. So I would not say it's the strongest demand, but, th but that's what, so a lot of places have trouble finding people with early childhood yeah. licensure. Uh, for lots of reasons we can go into. And so they, they provided this kind of endorsement system yeah. to, to get the elementary okay. school teachers there. And, and I think one of the reasons why they have problems finding those teachers is because until of the advent of school-based pre-K, they were being paid $13 right. an hour or $14 an hour. So if you were going to get your teaching degree, you were darn sure you were going to get a job that would pay you enough to pay back your loan. Well, your parents were. <laughs> yeah, right. So I think there's a reason why once these programs came on board, there wasn't a ready pool of highly skilled, qualified pre-K teachers. Now, uh, many of them are. I don't, I don't want to start um, right. making it seem as if there aren't some amazing pre-K teachers out there who were um, doing that. But, uh, you know, when you're really expanding, you need a large pool. But some of the older pre-K, older teachers who have, were certified in pre-K, pre say, 10 or 12, 15 years ago, are in despair about the pressures that they are under now in their classrooms. Yeah, it was just alarmingly um, alarming to hear how developmentally inappropriate. Yeah, yeah, it was. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I made the leap, having a background in early childhood <laughs> development, that perhaps they didn't have a lot of that. But but there certainly are a lot of other uh, things that could have contributed. It's also really hard if you're the only pre-K classroom in a K-5 or K-6 school to hold on to what you know is, is more appropriate. Yeah, and not cave. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my question's for Dale. With regard to the fade out from the VPK catch -up. students, <laughs> or the catch up, if you want to look <laughs> at it that way. The control group, um, because we know the VPK students were kids in poverty based on the qualifications. Were the control group students also from the same socioeconomic background? Well, not only, so this is what we have to keep saying to the field. Not only were, and I don't, I'll be careful, but not only were they, did they all meet the qualifications for being in, in Tennessee's pre-K program, they all applied. So one of the problems that we, ha so they, they, they all came from the same group of families who all applied to get their children into pre-K and who all met the qualifications, but, but there wasn't room for them. So we randomized the list and they took them in order of our, of our, we got it back to them in 24 hours. So they took them in the order in which we had randomized the list and, and we cut it off and those became, those who didn't get in became our treat. But what, you, what you've seen now, <coughs> it gets more, I don't know if you wanna go into all this, but, but some of these uh, parents got their kids into pre-K, into a, into a voluntary pre-K program anyway. So we, there are two ways to look at what we did. You can look at intent to treat, 
which is one, one way, which is wh what your random assignment was right from the outset. And we can look at treatment on treated. So did you, you know, did you, did you get in anyway? And for reasons that are maybe more than we want to talk about here, well, I'll tell you what. So there's four groups, those who, who were assigned to pre-K and went, those who were assigned to the control group and didn't go. They, they kept, they were compliers, they did their assignment. Those who were assigned to control group, but they got their kids into pre-K. It's not very many, but it's some. And those who were assigned to pre-K, they had an opportunity, but they didn't go. And when you look at those four groups long term, the worst off were those parents who got into pre-K, but couldn't get it together to get their children to attend. And the best off are those children who were not assigned to pre-K, but their parents got them in pre-K. So there's a huge parent component going on here, and that's the trouble with most matched groups after the fact, is that you can't control for any of those things that turn out to be really important parent-based things for four-year-olds if you're trying to match in, in fifth grade or eighth grade or some later point. Okay, so just a quick follow-up then is sure. those that are in the control group, were they in any other type of early learning program besides the VPK? So about 23% of them went to either Head Start or a group care program. And then we had some mixed, and then we had about 60%, 62% who were in um, relative care or family or parent care. A couple, one comment. If it would be interesting if, I don't think this is the case, if all the children entering that first grade or kindergarten program had been through the pre K, so the teacher could focus on, they, they wouldn't have a mixture of, uh, uh, that would have been an interesting experiment. But my, my real question is, why was Perry Preschool so successful? We didn't know all this back in the early 60s. And so, because your all this information is so different, Art. <laughs> yeah. We have all this information, the answer, and yeah. but, but I'm, so I'm curious. I mean, I, I, mean, I think th so. Part of the answer is that it really was. Uh, we did know some of this back in the day, right? I mean, so, so they had home visits. They worked with engaging parents. They had a language-rich curriculum. They used developmentally. You know, they didn't have any of the problems of didactic instruction, um, and they moved IQ, which is which is very hard to move, frankly, right? And there, the mothers were a very low education, uh, were very poor. It was a very disadvantaged sample that had very low life prospects. So even within Perry Preschool, I don't thirty percent of the treatment group still ended up in jail, right? So it's not as if this was. I mean, this was a very disadvantaged sample um, with very few family resources that got a very good program. Because as it turns out, back in the '60s, we did know something of what to do. I think. And, 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 and this was an hour and a half visit with the parents every we, we, week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In so, theory. so, so one other possible explanation, and this is happening, I think, in the public school system. We had a glass ceiling in the '60s. Yeah. You, exactly. you had a choice as a woman. You can go into oh. nursing, or you can sure, go. Yeah. We raised the glass ceiling. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can look at SAT scores, and you can see, on average, they're way down. Um, I'm not saying to bring the glass ceiling back. I'm saying to pay <laughs> a lot more. Yep. Uh, and, and I know you've said this. But, and I don't know how far we can go with that, but clearly we're not getting the best and the brightest coming into K through three or pre-K, and that's something we just have to face. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does somebody else? I guess it's okay. I guess it's me. So, um, uh, question, uh, uh, Catherine, can you expand on a comment you made? This is kind of a swerve off in a different direction, but you made the comment about. Uh, the importance of, of early childhood support for working parents, for, um, uh, for working class uh, uh, families. We've really focused a lot on the achievement gap and on the most at-risk kids, um, but I think there's an argument to be made that, that um, in fact, there's huge gains to be made even investing in somewhat higher income kids than the very most at risk um, because of how expensive it is to provide good quality care and development education, whatever that means, uh, well, well, well aimed at the right uh, age of kids. 
um, and that we're not paying enough workforce, et cetera, et cetera. So can you just expand on that, just the benefits to be made for that level up below the, the, the very most at risk and most vulnerable kids and the benefits for their families more broadly? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that we know is that the highest or the higher rates of, of uh, participation are for kids who have access either to subsidized care or um, pre-K programs, so publicly supported programs. And there is sort of the middle swath of families who are making fifty to $60,000. They're not qualifying for, um, for subsidies or Head Start, but they can't afford $15,000 of their paycheck on childcare. And, and what that does is it depresses maternal or parental employment, right? It puts parents in the situation of splitting shifts, finding non-standard work that can support their families. Mm -hmm. And so it can be a real stress uh, to figure it out and or they use friends and family so a lot of grandparents and neighbors and um, cousins or older siblings and those care arrangements uh, are fine in terms of you know making sure maybe the child is safe and happy but generally don't do as good a job at promoting that early learning of any kind um, constrained or unconstrained <laughs> skills and so there's a lot to be gained I think of thinking about investing in that middle income group there are somewhat lower returns um, in terms of learning, but not, they certainly gain a great deal from those programs. Um, and really, you know, the way to think about it is not that the bottom has been falling off and not catching up. It, we really have a situation in which the top has been increasingly investing in their children in large amounts of money, um, and everyone else is being left behind, frankly. And in fact, the bottom is investing proportionally more, more than the yeah. top. Yes. But it just doesn't have the same payoff because they don't have as right. much to invest. Right. Yes, that's correct. All right, we're. I just so I just want to pull a ro aromic here just for a second and just point out <laughs> that in follow up to that that arguably we are way under investing in the infants and toddlers of families yeah. fifty to sixty thousand yeah. uh, dollars. We're we're maybe even more under investing for lower income families. But that I think is at least part part of a response to some of the points being made earlier about universal pre K and, and targeted and scholarships, et cetera. We're actually under investing in all of our infants and toddlers except for maybe the the ones from the very most wealthy families. Thanks. Yes. And they also are the, I'm just, I guess, You're fine word. Yeah, yeah. They're the most expensive, right? So once yeah. once you start talking about infants, um, it's just ridiculous how much money you can and, and in fact, <laughs> the public system, as pre-K expands, and and it, it, it and if, if it's universal, it draws parents out of the private system, and it makes that infant-toddler care Even more much more, more expensive right. because it's their four-year-olds mm -hmm. that they can charge and then get some money from that will actually support yeah. the infants and toddlers. Right. So. Yes. Yep. <laughs> uh, thank you so thank much, you. Catherine and Dale, uh, for joining us today. And thank you, everybody, for having us.